Hello and welcome to our first lesson of level one where we will be discussing what are games. And now you'd think we'd start with the definition of a game, but this is actually pretty hard to do because there's so many different types of games. So to start, I'm going to say that the definition of a game is pretty fuzzy. And instead of going right for the definition, we're going to start by defining what games are. There really isn't a solid, conclusive definition of a game. Online, if you Google it, you're going to find many different definitions of a game. So how do you know what one is the right one? The definition has room for interpretation because games are so diverse. Like I mentioned before, we have board games, video games, sporting events, puzzles. It's hard to sum up all of the different types of games into just one single definition. So instead, we're going to start by trying to describe what games are, rather than how they can be defined. The first thing we know about games is that they are playful. And there's a couple of different definitions of play. Play can mean to engage in activity for enjoyment and recreation, or they can mean to take part in something. Now the first definition that we have there, to engage in enjoyment and recreation, I want you to consider the sentence, the children were playing outside. Now in this sense, the word playing tells us that the children were enjoying themselves or that they were doing some type of recreational activity and um, there it's easy to come to the definition of play. Or if we look at the second definition that we have there for play, which is to take part in something. I have the sentence example of I play softball. Now this tells um, your listener that you take part in the game of softball, which we um, sum up through the verb of play. There's a relationship between play and work in nearly every game experience, depending on your actions as a player. Play means acting for fun and work means acting for purpose. When one is engaged in play, they often become immersed in the flow of the experience. And we've all experienced the, this before, if you've ever lost track of time while you were playing a game. This delightful flow state occurs when the player is both having fun while acting for purpose. However, we're gonna save this conversation about flow state into level two, because it actually has a lot larger of a role in gamer motivation, which is what we're gonna be learning about next. However, if you think about your own experiences as a player in any type of game, whether it be a sport, a video game, a board game, I'm sure you've experienced this type of flow state before. And part of the reason why you've experienced this is because you are combining play and work, having fun while acting for purpose. Another thing that we know about games is that games are interactive. Games are different each time you play, and this is what we mean by interactive. Not just the experience itself is different, but sometimes the actual game itself is different based on the decisions that you make. Now, I know I have a lot of different athletes in my student population. Um, a lot of lacrosse players, hockey players, football players, wrestlers, I have just about someone represented on every sports team here at North. Now, every time you have a game or a match, you're playing the same game technically, no matter what that game may be. However, the experience is different every single time based on the decisions that you make and the decisions that your teammates make as players on the team, beginning from that very first whistle. And this is what draws players into games. The same goes for board games and video games too. I love to play board games. Although I've played the same game, like Scrabble, multiple different times, I've never had the exact same outcome or experience twice. Again, this is what draws players into games. You are enjoying the play, but because of the interactive level of it, the fact that um, they're constantly different and changing based on the decisions that you make, make us enjoy them and make us keep coming back to continue to play them again. Now in the video game aspect, if you've ever played a game like Among Us or Fortnite or racing games or Modern Warfare, which I have a couple of map pictures there below, you also know that you can play the same game many different times 
and still have a different experience each time. So we're getting close to approaching our definition of games. Because if we put those two things together that we just came up to the con came to the conclusion that games are, we're getting close to definition. So a game occurs when playful meets interactive. So the working definition that I've put on the screen here, games are something a player takes part or engages in that results in a different and unique experience each time. So I've matched the colors to the respective definitions. Playful means to take part or engage in. And purple for, or orange for interactive tells us that there's a different and unique experience each time. So we're getting very close to our game definition here. Now as we move forward, we're going to look at the key features that all games have in common. All games have these three features that you see on your screen here. Rules, goals, and mechanics. In fact, if you suspect something is a game and it doesn't have these three things, it probably cannot be considered a game. These three features are actually what make games both unique and interactive. Now in our in-person version of this lesson, we're going to debate, for all my Star Wars fans out there, whether or not a lightsaber battle can be considered a game. But for our online version, for the sake of time, I only have um, about 15 minutes before it cuts me off. We're going to save that conversation for a later time. And we're going to start breaking down these game features. Now the first one we have here is rules. Rules define the parts of a game. They tell us what is and what is not a part of the game. Rules are important because without them, there is no game. You're just playing. So our big takeaway here for this feature is that there, if there is no rules, there is no game. Next in our in-person version of this lesson, we're gonna take some time to discuss some of the most important rules in a game that you play. Since I don't have anyone to discuss with here, I'm just going to share my example with you. I'm using soccer as my example because that's one sport that I know pretty well. I was a soccer player um, all throughout high school. And one of the most important rules in the game of soccer is that you cannot use your hands. Now, without this rule, it wouldn't quite be soccer. You could use your hands to move the ball from one end of the field to the other. You'd be playing a completely different game. So this rule plays a critical part in telling us what soccer is and also what soccer is not. And therefore, it's a very crucial part of soccer being considered a game. So next, we're going to move on to that second feature, which is goals. Goals create direction and narrative in play. Goals imply an outcome and guide, but not force actions. If there is no goals, it is not a game. It's just a toy. Now I have an example here. I want you to consider a Rubik's Cube. Now when you play with a Rubik's Cube, you have a goal that's kind of guiding the movements that you make to the Rubik's Cube. And your goal is to get all six of the respective colors lined up on their side. So since you're, when you're playing with a Rubik's Cube, you're working towards that goal or that outcome of having all of the, all of the colors line up, a Rubik's Cube is considered a game. Now my second example, I want you to consider a ball. Now there's a lot of different games that can be played with a ball, but a ball itself outside of a game is just a toy because there's no implied goal or outcome when you pick up a ball. Um, it's up to you how you choose to play with it. So since there's no set goal, it's just considered a toy. Now in my in-person version of this lesson, we're gonna debate the game Sims and whether, or we're gonna debate Sims and whether or not it is a game or just a virtual toy. And since we don't have time for discussion in our video version of this lesson, I'm going to share my conclusion with you. One would play with a Sim almost as if one would play with a Barbie doll. Is a Sim not technically a virtual doll? On that basis, I'm gonna call Sims a virtual toy. The world of Sims is basically just a virtual dollhouse in which the player can develop personal goals within that game, but the, in the game itself, there's no definitive goals that players are working towards. So under that understanding, Sims is just a virtual toy. So now we're gonna move on to our final game feature, 
mechanics. And bear with me with, for this one. This is just our first introduction to mechanics, and it might seem a little bit confusing or a little bit tricky in this first explanation, but we're gonna work with mechanics a lot closer throughout level one, and you should be pretty comfortable by the end. Mechanics tell us that games are interactive systems, and there's an entire process that keeps the momentum of a game going. It starts with the game pushing out info or input to a player. So think of this like a scenario. So whether it be a challenge or something along those lines, the game pushes out some type of info to the player. The player then processes and thinks through this info and decides what they're going to do next. The player then responds to this info and we call that output. That's the player action in the game based on whatever scenario the game pushed out. Then the game processes the player's decision, responds to the player through feedback. Either something good happens, something bad happens in response to that action, and then this process just keeps repeating over and over and over again. And I made a graph for us that we can kind of visualize this process for the mechanics of a game. Again, we start with input. The game pushes out info to the player. The player then processes this info and decides what to do. Then the player gives output back to the game. The player responds to this info, either by making a choice, doing something, etc. Then the player gets feedback based on their action. Either something good happens, something bad happens, and then this process just keeps repeating over and over again. So in a nutshell, those are our three features of games and a brief overview of how the role that they play within games. So we're gonna end this virtual lesson here by talking about how mechanics disqualify a lot of things from being a game. The first two features we talked about, rules and goals, there's a lot of things that have rules and goals. However, lacking mechanics keeps them from being considered a game. And I have two examples included for us here. The first one I'm gonna talk about is gardening. If you've ever gardened before, you know that there's certain rules and there's certain goals that come with gardening. Your goal is pretty obvious. It's to bear a plant. Whether you're trying to grow a fruit or a vegetable or just, you know, a daisy or some flowers, your goal is growth. Now there's certain rules that come with gardening that you have to follow if you're going to receive growth. Things like making sure that plant is in soil, it receives water, it receives sunlight, Gardening has rules and it has goals. However, there are no mechanics in gardening. There is no process of input, processing, output, in feedback. So therefore, this disqualifies gardening from being considered a game. Now, the second one I have here is running. And this one can be tricky because we have teams dedicated to running, like track and like cross country, People run marathons, 5Ks, things like that. However, running is not considered a game because it does not have mechanics. Of course, there's rules and goals associated with running. Your goal might be to achieve a certain distance or to achieve a, a certain time. And there's rules that go along with running too. Okay, now in some running like leagues or whatever, you can't wear jewelry when you're running. You can't wear certain types of shoes. However, there are no mechanics when it comes to running. No process of receiving input, processing that input, player giving out that output, and then the game processing that feedback. So therefore running is not considered a game. It's just an activity. We would end our in-person version of this lesson by discussing what other activities we can brainstorm that have rules and goals, but not mechanics. So this is where we leave this virtual lesson for today. Be sure to check Google Classroom for any challenges that go along with this lesson and other activities accordingly.